the triumphal entry into Jerusalem was more of a protest march than it was an act of worship. Crowds had gathered to disrupt community life, and it needed disruption. Their symbols of protest would not have gone unnoticed by the police who were there to protect the government, no matter where their personal loyalties lay. The crowd saw Jesus coming down the road on a donkey, and they cheered. This was a familiar scene, one that was etched in their memory and was replayed over and over and over again when they remembered the words of the prophet Zechariah, who said, the coming of Zion's king, see your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And here was Jesus doing exactly what Zechariah said he would. Or at least they understood what Jesus was doing, invoking that promise for himself. When that donkey came into sight, they saw Jesus proclaiming himself king of Israel, much to their joy and delight, but also much to the anger and the fear of the religious authorities, specifically the Sanhedrin, who had their own king placed there by the Roman government the king who had kept the religious leaders well paid in their comfortable jobs in return for their political support. But this king, lowly and riding on a donkey, wasn't the corrupt monarch who played nice with the enemy in order to keep some sort of peace. This king knew what their lives were like because he was one of them. This king lowly and riding on a donkey knew what it was like to be hungry. This king knew what it was like to live in squalor. This king knew what it was like to live hand to mouth in a day-to-day -day struggle with survival by those who had a vested interest in keeping them poor. This king knew what it was like to bury too many friends and family taken far too soon. And when they saw Jesus, the king, riding on a donkey, a symbol of peace, rather than on a stallion, a symbol of war, the crowd ran and they grabbed their, their palm branches, ancient symbols of victory, and they waved them joyfully in the air and they cheered, cheered wildly as Jesus came closer to them. But others gathered garments to lay on the ground for Jesus and the donkey to walk on. Garments, the symbols of peace through triumph, mirroring the ceremony of the Roman triumph, where Romans donned a special toga to show everyone that they were victorious over their enemy. Even the words they shouted, while being recognizably religious, had political overtones that were hard to miss. Hosanna! to the son of David, they shouted. Hosanna meaning save us, save us, son of David, save us, they cried out. And everyone with an earshot knew what they meant. This was not a cry to heaven. They weren't looking to Jesus to send their souls to celestial bliss when they died. No, they were crying out for a political salvation. They were crying out for victory over their enemies. They were crying out for God to defeat those who had been crushing them. They were crying out for God to tell them that all their cries, their prayers, their lamentations had finally been heard and that now, now was their time. Their time had now come. So save us, son of David. Save us from these Roman tyrants and their Israelite puppets who were growing rich from keeping us in poverty. Save us from these foreign powers who have taken our land and then give us back our sovereignty. Save us from watching generations of our young men being murdered on crosses while their mothers, sisters, daughters, and wives watched in helpless despair and then were left with nothing. Save us from a life not worth living where our day-to-day -day existence 
leads only to the freedom of death. Hosanna, save us, son of David. Bring back your kingdom. Bring back that moment in history when we were a powerful nation. Bring back that time when we were strong. Bring back that moment when we were secure. Bring back that time when we were prosperous. Bring back that time when we ruled our own destiny, charted our own course, built great things, and worshiped our God without fear. Save us, son of David. David's memory was etched deeply in Israel's psyche. They remembered the glory days of King David and his empire. They remembered when they were feared. They remembered when they were strong. They remembered when they stood on their own two feet and other nations bowed to them. And when they saw Jesus, they saw the hope and the promise of a return to that time when David sat on the throne and they wanted him back on it. But who knows what Jesus was thinking when he heard their cries. He may have had a sense of what his mission in Jerusalem was, and he knew it wasn't what the people were crying out for. He knew that David wasn't coming back, at least not in the way that they wanted. And it's not as if he didn't understand their cries. It's not as if he didn't feel in his own bones the fear and the anger that the other Jews felt. He was one of them. He knew hunger. He knew the struggle for survival. He knew what it was like to work his fingers raw but still have little to feed his family with. He knew what grief was. He remembered his cousin John, whom they called the baptizer, whose head was cut off on a whim by a king whose ego was bigger than his brain or his heart. And he walked by forests of crosses, probably knowing that one of them was waiting for him in Jerusalem. So as he entered the holy city with cries of, save us, son of David, his feelings may have been mixed. He knew the crowd loved him, but he also knew that his mission wasn't to restore the kingdom of Israel. His mission was bigger and broader than that. And he knew that once the people realized that he wasn't going to fulfill those longings, they would turn on him. But still, save us, son of David, rang in his ears. And I wonder if we haven't stopped praying that. I wonder if that's the prayer that we're still crying out. Save us, son of David. Especially when we look out into the world with everything that's been happening lately. This week's news has been awful. From the chemical weapons attack in Syria, which is resulting in thousands of more refugees trying to escape than to the bombing attacks in response. We can debate the proportionality of the response and at the same time grieve that violence needs to be met with violence. And then there's Russia expressing outrage at the bombing. And then the relations between them and the West have become even edgier than they have been recently. And then there's North Korea bent on creating an intercontinental ballistic missile that can reach North America although that I think is probably the North Koreans and the Japanese who are most nervous about North Korea's growing nuclear capabilities. And these countries moving towards war. That was just this week. What's going to happen next week? And so we cry out, save us, son of David. Save us from this world determined on destroying itself. Save us from the human compulsion to destroy what you have so lovingly created. 
Save us from the need to hurt others in order to make ourselves look strong. Save us from each other and save us from ourselves. Today, April 9th, is the 100th anniversary of the Battle of Vimy Ridge. And many Canadians are in France today to remember that battle, which became a turning point in World War I. And some say that it was in this battle that Canada finally became a nation. It wasn't because of the victory that was achieved that day. Some historians suggest that the battle itself was a draw, since the Germans didn't really want to recapture that ridge. But historian Jonathan Vance said that, although the battle is not generally considered the greatest achievement of the Canadian Corps in strategic importance or results obtained, it was the first instance in which all four Canadian divisions made up of troops drawn from all parts of the country, fought as a cohesive formation. This unity, many have said, created a country, a nation, a people, those of us who came together in a fight for freedom. It was a con in conflict that we were born, if we believe the assessments of the historians. And today we remember those sacrifices but we also grieve the need for that sacrifice. Today is not a celebration, but a solemn day of remembrance of many lives lost, of futures ended, of families destroyed. Today is a solemn day of remembrance and thanksgiving for those who stepped up and answered the call to serve and who gave their greatest gift to keep their country free, but also we mourn the fact that people still need to answer that call and give their lives so that the world can still live. So today, as we remember Vimy Ridge and all who fought on our behalf, we look to our own situation today and we might join with our sisters and brothers of so many centuries ago and we cry out, Hosanna, son of David, save us. Save us from our worst impulses. Save us from the violence that haunts our hearts and leads nations to war. Save us from our vested self-interest that keeps people in poverty. Save us from a limited vision of the world that cannot see a peaceful future. Save us from succumbing to hopelessness and despair as we look out into the coming months and years. Save us from our own anger and fear that, that leads to hatred. Save us from others who would hurt us and save us from ourselves as we would hurt others. And that prayer and all the prayers who cry out to God from their own time of place, with their own hurts, their own hopelessness, their own grief, their own anger, these prayers meet Jesus' ears. And so Jesus looks out into our world. He sees the pain the devastation, the hurt, the longing, the outrage, the threats to our safety and to our very existence. And he responds the only way a loving God knows how to respond. He responds this way. This is the passion and death of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Matthew, the 27th chapter. When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people conferred together against Jesus in order to bring about his death. They bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. When Jesus, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he repented and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. Judas said, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. But they said, what is that to us? See to it yourself. Throwing down the pieces of silver in the temple, he departed, and he went and hanged himself. But the chief priest, taking the pieces of silver, said, It is not lawful to put them into the treasury, since they are blood money. After conferring together, they used them to buy the potter's field as a place to bury foreigners. For this reason, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. 
And they took the 30 pieces of silver, the price of the one on whom a price had been set, on whom some of the people of Israel had set a price, and they gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord commanded me. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, you say so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he did not answer. Then Pilate said to him, do you not hear how many accusations they make against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the festival, the governor was accustomed to release a prisoner for the crowd, anyone whom they wanted. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Jesus Barabbas. So after they had gathered, Pilate said to them, whom do you want me to release for you, Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who was called the Messiah? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that they had handed him over. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, Pilate's wife sent word to him, have nothing to do with this innocent man, for today I have suffered a great deal because of a dream about him. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus killed. The governor again said to them, which one of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. And Pilate said to them, then what should I do with Jesus who is called the Messiah? All of them said, let him be crucified. And then he asked, why, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he could do nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took some water and washed his hands before the crowd saying, I am innocent of this man's blood, see to it yourselves. Then the people as a whole answered, his blood be upon us and upon our children. So he re released Barabbas for them. And after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters. They gathered the whole cohort around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on his head. They put a reed on his right hand and knelt before him and mocked him saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. After mocking him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they came upon a man from Cyrene named Simon. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when he had crucified him, they divided his clothes among themselves by casting lots. Then they sat down there and kept watch over him. Over his head, they put the charge against him, which read, this is Jesus, King of the Jews. Then two bandits were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, you who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and, and the elders, were mocking him, saying, he saved others, he cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now, and we will believe him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he wants to. For he said, I am God's son. The bandits who were crucified with him also taunted him in the same way. From noon on, Darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sakbathani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, this man is calling for Elijah. 
At once one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a stick and gave it for him to drink. But others said, wait, let us see if Elijah will come to save him. Then Jesus cried again with a loud voice and he breathed his last. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. After his resurrection, they came out of the tomb and entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now when the centurion and those with him who were keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and what, what took place, they were terrified and they said, truly, this man was God's son. Many women were there also, looking on from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee and provided for him. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Joseph and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who was also a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. So Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn from the rock. Then he rolled a great stone to the door of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there, sitting opposite the tomb. The next day, that is, after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we, we remember what that imposter said while he was still alive. After three days, I will rise again. Therefore, command the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may go and steal him away and tell the people he has been raised from the dead and the last deception would be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, you have a guard of soldiers. Go make it as secure as you can. So they went with the guard and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone. <laughs> 